right, so uh, we've been making our way through male reproductive endocrinology, specifically talking about uh, the, the testicular function. Um, we've also talked a little bit about ovarian function here as well as we talk through development of male versus female. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit more now about the role of the androgen to key into a process known as spermatogenesis. Um, so the androgens, they have important roles in development, but they also have important roles beyond development as well. So just to kind of give you a summary of what we talked about and where we're going, androgens help out with fetal development, help with the progression of the Wolfian system over the Valerian system. The androgens, including dihydrotestosterone, uh, as well as testosterone, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and di, uh, dihydroheptic endosterone, uh, help with the development of our accessory sex organs. Then as we progress beyond fetal development and embryogenesis, we move into uh, uh, into childhood and then into adulthood in the male. And uh, one of the things that becomes very important for the male reproductive system is function So we'll, we'll hit on some other roles for the androgens in adulthood, but spermatogenesis is one of the primary responsibilities for the androgens. And so that's what I want to pick up with, kind of transitioning away from the development of the fetus, the hypothalamus, the development of the accessory, uh, accessory sex organ, and androgens roles in, in those processes, and start to talk about spermatogenesis. So spermatogenesis, is the process by which the male sex DNA is going to be contained and produced. Um, and so that's going to be the sperm cell. In humans, in all mammalian species, we need to produce a haploid cell, and that means we have half the uh, half of the genetic material that a normal somatic or body cell has. And so we have to be able to go through a process that takes a diploid cell and converts it into haploid cell. And we're just going to have 23 chromosomes, basically half of dad's 23 chromosomes set at the end of spermatogenesis. So spermatogenesis requires FSH. However, that FSH appears to only be required at the onset of spermatogenesis, which begins at puberty. Probably only required at initiation at puberty. And in fact, it might be this involvement of FSH that would signal the beginning of the pubescence process, the beginning of puberty. And one of the observations that has been made when FSH levels begin to increase during puberty or signaling puberty, one of the responses is to undergo hyperplasia of Sartoli cells. What is hyperplasia? So there are two ways in which tissue can grow. They can either grow by cell size, increase in cell size, or by increase in cell number. Hyperplasia is an increase in cell number. Hypertrophy is an increase in cell size. So with FSH at puberty, hyperplasia or an increase in the number of Sertoli cells begins to occur. 
And I want to take a look at some more experimental data here to kind of support this assertion that FSH is at least, and most likely, probably only required during initiation and induces this hyperplasia of Sertoli cell. So, if we look at two different types of rats, either immature or mature rats that have been hypothesectomized. Okay, so basically we have rats that have not undergone maturation to puberty or rats that have undergone maturation through puberty and then they've been hypothesectomized. What's that mean? We've removed the hypothesis. What's the other name for the hypothesis? The pituitary. Okay? So these rats are going to be missing a pituitary. So we're technically taking out our source of FSH. So based off of this information, what do you think is going to happen in these two different types of rats? Okay, so immature won't mature, and what might we see or not see happen in that immature animal? Because it's still going to age, right? So as it ages, what will we probably see or what will we probably not see? We probably won't see some of these morphological changes, including this increase in the number of Sertoli cells. How about the mature animal? So the mature animal, if we're saying FSH is only really required for the onset, these animals should already have had hyperplasia of their Sertoli cell. The question becomes, are they generating testosterone and regulating spermatogenesis? Most likely, they are. So, if these individuals, we administer FSH, now what are we kind of thinking might happen? One of the things that we actually see happen is there's an increase in testicular size. So that's probably related to the development of the Sertoli cells. But what we actually do not see, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we had thought, is there is no increase in sperm maturation. So no increase in sperm maturation. No increase in secretion from the lytic cells. If you remember that the Sertoli cells are the support cells, the lytic cells are actually going to be the cells that help to produce the energy. And so our initial thoughts probably are not correct. I can understand why we would conclude what we would, but now we're saying, seeing some scientific data here, and it's, the experimental data is pointing us sort of in a little bit different direction. So we see the increase in testicular size, which is probably related to the Sertoli cell hyperplasia, but we don't see what we're expecting kind of after the maturation process, the sperm production, and maturation and the Sartoli cell, or I'm sorry, the lytic cells release the entities. And so when we step back, really what it looks like is FSH is priming the system, causing Sartoli cell hyperplasia, but we have other requirements for the progression of spermatogenesis. 
And so it turns out that spermatogenesis also requires testosterone. And this turns out is what we would refer to as an absolute requirement. An absolute requirement. So if we take our exact same animals, our immature or our mature animals, hypothesize them. Now, first take and apply testosterone. We observe no spermatogenesis. However, if you take the same type of animal and first give FSH, then give testosterone, we now initiate spermatogenesis. So it appears that the order, FSH, then testosterone, is critically important to be able to mature that um, spermatogenic process. Interestingly enough, if we take a hypothesectomized adult rat, And we don't allow testicular regression. How might we do that? Well, we hypothesize them, and then we provide testosterone alone before there's any regression. So relative to quickly administer testosterone, what we actually see is that with just testosterone alone, these animals Undergo, begin to undergo spermatogenesis. So no FSH was required. FSH initiated. We remove FSH in the mature animal, the adult animal, provide testosterone after that system has been primed, and we get spermatogenesis. Okay? So you kind of see from the experimental data what's required here. As a, map, as a rat matures, we require FSH first to cause Sartoli cell hyperplasia and to prime the system. Then we require testosterone to initiate and utilize the spermatogenic system. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a rundown here on kind of the summary of what's happening here. If we start out with FSH, FSH actually interacts through a cyclic AMP second messenger system with the Sartoli cells. LH, you'll remember, interacts with the lighting cell. When FSH initiates the Sartoli cells, causes hyperplasia, we also are going to see an induction of a protein called androgen binding protein. Yeah, LH is luteinizing hormone. So the Sartoli cells, they undergo hyperplasia, but then they also begin to produce androgen binding protein, ADP. ADP binds to testosterone. It is actually being synthesized by the lidate cells in that testosterone, before it binds to ADP, 
ATP gets sent back onto the Bertoli cells, helps to facilitate spermatogenesis. Okay, so this is our priming of the system. FSH to the Sartoli cells. LH causes testosterone to be produced when the Sartoli cells are primed. Testosterone causes the Sartoli cells to interact with the spermatogenic process. Spermatogenesis continues. But the Sartoli cells, when they interact with the FSH, are also created, or also caused, I should say, to produce ADP, anti binding protein. That binds to testosterone. This becomes real important. Why do you think this becomes real important? Think about the, chemo the chemistry of testosterone. What type of molecule is this? It's a lipid. I'm now wrapping it up in antigen binding protein, which makes it hydrophilic. I now have my mechanism at the point of puberty. This is when all of this is happening, where testosterone now has a uh, highly has a, a increased ability to enter into the bloodstream. And we now start to get some systemic roles outside of systemic roles outside of the uh, the reproductive system. We all have all of the future systems that down. So FSH initiates it. The lighting cell calls testosterone to be produced, but really testosterone prior to puberty is not really having any systemic role because we don't have the ability to really move into the bloodstream. FSH kicks out androgen binding protein. Androgen binding protein induces testosterone's ability to now enter the bloodstream. So at the point of puberty, we begin to see some changes. And you are all aware of those changes. We have things like increase in muscle mass. Production of the uh, of pubic hair, axillary hair, other body hair, etc. Evening of the voice, the vocal cords are uh, responding to changes. So the other thing that happens here with androgen body protein is testosterone does come back to the Sartoli cells. But the increase in androgen binding protein allows the Sartoli cells to ex be exposed to larger quantities of testosterone. And begin to sequester that testosterone. And then that testosterone is used in progression spermatic acid. All right, so let's talk here a little bit about the systemic roles. Once androgens begin to leave into the bloodstream. So, by and large, we can look at the systemic role, roles as happening in two different categories. The first are classified as the anabolic actions of the androgens. So whenever you see the term anabolic, say Mark McGuire or Barry Bonds, and if you watch Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds in the early 90s, they were relatively normal, and if you watch them later, <laughs> they're pretty big. So they had anabolic steroid use, they caused them to increase in size. So anabolic effects are increases in size. So we have things like increase in muscle mass, you know, increased muscle growth. So we're going to call those myotropic effects, effects on the muscle. IOB to the muscle. We're also going to see overall body growth. In maybe in elementary school, you're around 12, 14 years of age, what happens? 
you look at your length and get taller, right? A, a lot of times, you know, you look at your like third grade, fourth grade picture, and here's all the boys, and here's all the girls, and then like a year later, it's like here's all the girls, here's all the boys, right? There's like this massive shift that happens where all of a sudden the guys, so they start to, in puberty, they have that body growth, they start to get taller, and they start to get larger muscles, heavier, etc. So those are the anabolic or the, the size changes that happen. But there's also androgenic effects. Androgenic effects. And the androgenic effects are the effects that really take all of the, the 11 organ systems and we undergo what I'm going to refer to as systemic masculinization. So what are the characteristics beyond large muscles or bigger muscles and body height, larger body height, taller body height? What are the changes that we think about? We think about a deepening of the voice. We think about increases in body hair. We think about changes in aggressive, aggression, aggressive behavior. So these are the systemic masculinization characteristics or things that are happening. Now, just because it is who I am, I also want to put a plug in. And it looks like the sex steroids also help maintain and promote physical activity. Put a question mark in there. I'm still working on that question. But it appears that there is a pretty heavy relationship between both uh, rodents and in humans between the steroids and physical activity levels. So while we're on the topic of the systemic roles of the androgens, why don't we also take a look at the systemic role of the estrogen? Now, we already know that the estrogen is actually going to influence the masculinization process of the male brain. But are there any estrogenic effects after development and at other times during the life cycle of mammals? So if we look at what are called male estrogen receptor knockout mites. So these are mites where one of the estrogen receptors, we have two that are classical or canonical, estrogen receptor alpha, we have estrogen receptor beta. So those are technically the proteins, ERS, ERS1, and ERS2 are the genes for both of those proteins. So if we take and we knock out ERS1, we produce no functional estrogen receptor alpha, and vice versa. If we disrupt ERS2, we lose uh, estrogen receptor beta, we, we, we lose that protein. So those are the types of animals that we're looking at. And so we produce specifically male estrogen receptor knockout mice. And what we actually find, and this is, again, we've knocked out, it, it's a, it's a, a dual knockout, both both estrogen receptors have been knocked out. We're not doing a specific estrogen receptor alpha knockout or estrogen receptor beta knockout. What we end up observing in these animals is infertility. So they're infertile. But the reason that they're infertile is not because of a morphological infertility. There's some sort of change or they haven't formed anything with no anatomical change, it's actually a functional change. So there's a functional infertility, and it's related to the function of the epididymis. The epididymis has a decrease in its ability to reabsorb water.
Now, because the epididymis decreases its absorption or reabsorption of water, the sperm cells become concentrated. And non-fluid or concentrated sperm is not effective functionally at fertilizing a fecal. Okay, so we have some functional changes with the estrogen knockout animal in terms of the epididymis function and sperm concentration. We actually also, in the male knockout, see fusion issues of the epithelial plate. The epithelial plate. We end up with some changes that happen here. So hopefully you remember from A and P that the epiphyseal plate is the growth plate in bone. If the epiphyseal plate remains open, the bone continues to elongate. Individuals get taller and taller and taller. It turns out that one of the potent factors is estrogen to cause the fusing of the growth plate. So what we've actually observed in another model system is if we look at males in their 20s, who are classified as estrogenic, are classified to have estrogenic deficiency. So low levels of estrogen, males in their 20s, right around the time the growth plate should, uh, should fuse and basically uh, vertical growth should stop. We observe that their growth plates are not fused. And on average, they'll be over six feet, eight inches tall. Average, the average. Adult height in males, like in the United States, is right around, um, I think it's six foot one. Right now, it's kind of seven. So, six foot eight, these people are relatively tall individuals in the population. Okay. So, everything that we've talked about up until this point, I think we're what you would say was chapter 16, chapter 17, now we're for Dr. Sister. Uh, the last couple of lectures, I'm going to kind of try to combine chapters 18 and 19, which is going to deal with female reproductive system. I'm just going to continue right along in the notes. This is the point where we're switching over to female reproductive system. So female reproductive system, we've already sort of talked quite a bit about the developmental process and the target, the, the default is to target the female. A big part of that is because we're growing and developing in a during environment that's maternal. Um, and so that kind of default programming is overridden by the presence of the Y chromosome, the SRY gene test is the determining factor. So if we don't have that, develop the malarian system, go ahead and develop ovaries, uh, and develop the uterus, and then the other parts of the internal, external, you know, different area. I want to take the, the first part of this to step back to field development and to specifically look at What's happening 
with the ovaries specifically. So as the ovaries are the uh, from the undifferentiated gonad become the, the, the prominent gonad to develop develop. What we actually find in humans is the ovary nerve fetal development will have between six and seven million OO sites or OO gonia, which are the primordial cells that eventually will be utilized to produce the ovum that is used to uh, as the female sex again, right? So 23 chromosome, 23 chromosome contained cell. Yeah, G O N I A, O O G O N I A, O O S E X. So about six to seven million, and that's across both of the ovaries. So it's roughly three, three and a half million in each of two ovaries. So that's during fetal development, and as fetal development progresses, that number is reduced to about one million at birth. And at birth, they're going to have undergone a process, or they've begun a process that is known as oogenesis. And so they've begun this process, and these one million are now referred to as the primary oocytes. Now, these cells are quiescent, and they'll be quiescent until the point of puberty. And during that time, we typically have a loss of about half of these primary homocytes. And again, this is between the two ovaries. And so about 500,000 remain at puberty. So the question becomes, well, where, where are the other you know, almost five and a half, six and a half million, where, where are they going? They're just simply going through atresia, which means they're just being reabsorbed. The cells are being broken down and they're just recycled. So at puberty, you have about 500,000. This is what's known as the reproductive supply. And this is kind of looking ahead. Every cycle, about 10 to 15 of these 500,000 will begin this process to do the rest of the oogenesis. So you typically will have just a single, in humans, a single oocyte that matures to an ovum, and that's what is ovulated during the reproductive cycle or during the uh, ovarian portion of the reproductive cycle. All right, so let's kind of get into the nuts and bolts here of what's going on. So, <coughs> In females, the way that we model what's happening in the reproductive system after puberty is known as the, is, is the reproductive cycle. The reproductive cycle is comprised of two parallel cycles. One is the ovarian cycle, that's what's happening in the ovary. The other, the other is the uterine cycle, that's what's happening in the uterus. Now, I don't know if I said this or not, maybe I have, but the process of successfully fertilizing an egg is almost impossible. And so we have to do everything that we can from a physiological perspective to make the impossible probable. And clearly, because you all are here and there's another 7 billion of us on this planet, the probability, uh, the, the system is, is well peaked to create um, the, the impossible or to overcome the impossible. And some of that's going to come up here in uh, the ovarian portion of the reproductive cycle, or what we refer to as the ovarian cycle. So this is a cross-section through an ovary. I'm going to move it over just a little bit so we can see the full figure on the board. So what you're looking at here is this is a cross section through the ovary. This is the ovarian ligament on this side. Then this is your um, your blood supply coming in, um, carrying in 
get your uh, oxygen rich blood and delivering out the oxygen, oxygen deficient blood. And so there's an intense capillary system throughout the um, entire ovary. Now, each kind of little step along the way here, we're kind of moving around in this direction. It's a, it's a, it's a static picture, right? It's not a movie. And so technically, when you have ovulation or you have development of the follicle development uh, during the ovarian cycle, it's not cycling through the ovary like this. It happens at one location and then ovulation occurs. You might have a second location for the next month where it all occurs. And there's this leftover, what I'm going to refer to as sort of like scar tissue that gets left over after ovulation happens. Okay, so I'm just trying to give you an idea of how to kind of look at this, kind of put it in your mind that this isn't happening in it, that the ovary doesn't have the ovary just spinning around it, right? It's happening in a single location, but because it's a static picture, we kind of show each different stage within the, uh, within the ovary at different locations within that tissue. So in your mind, you should put kind of like 10, 15 different pictures and cycle through them. And in each of those pictures at this location, this is happening. And then at this location, this is happening. At this location, this location, this is happening. Does that make sense? So it kind of goes through the entire process at one geographic location in the ovary every 28 days leading to ovulation. So the purpose of the ovarian cycle is for the oocyte to undergo development into what's known as a follicle. The definition that we're going to use for a follicle is it's the oocyte plus a initially single layer of granulosa cells. A single layer of granulosa cells. These are a squamous type cell or a scale type cell. Okay? So you start out with the individual cell containing the, the genetic material called an oocyte. The cell still is in the diploid configuration. These cells are what have developed, start out at 6, 7 million, and slowly regress down to about 500,000 in each of our ovary, 250, 300,000 in each ovary, and are basically in this phase of the, of the cell cycle that's known as G0. So cell cycle, remember, G1, F, G2, and then mitosis. G0 is sort of a branch off of the cell cycle where that cell goes quiescent and no longer moves through the cycle. Okay. So up until puberty, these cells are just kind of stuck in a G0 phase. Then puberty occurs, and we now begin to switch these cells back over out of G0 into an active progression of the cell cycle. And the first initial step is to form this oocyte with a single layer of squamous cells surrounding it. Uh, and those squamous cells are specifically called granulosa cells. So this whole structure here is known as the primordial follicle. The primordial follicle. It's that primordial follicle that begins the process and transitions from the primordial follicle into the primary follicle. So this is that switch between G0 and now actively back into cellular growth. So the primary follicle begins to develop. We observe an increase in the size of the oocytes. So oocyte size increases. And we move from a single layer of granulosa cells to now increasing the number of granulosa cells into multiple layers. We also have a shift that happens in these cells morphology. So they were squamous cells above, and as they increase in number, they also transition to become euboidal in shape.
So as the primary follicle develops, the oocyte increases in size, the granulosa cells increase in number, they transition to a cuboidal shape. It is this primary follicle that begins to be exposed to hormones during that puberty process and after. So the primary follicle, follicle begins to be exposed to hormones, in particular the FSH into estrogen. FSH and estrogen are going to be used to promote further development of the primary follicle and we begin to see the development of what's known as a secondary follicle. And I want to take a look at the anatomy of the secondary follicle. So we start out here with our primary follicle, individual layer of squamous cells, individual oocyte, and then as we move on to our, I'm sorry, primordial follicle, we move on to our primary follicle. We have this transition where we increase the size of the oocyte, and you can see that there are more layers of those cuboidal cells. Uh, so more granulosa cells. Then we're going to begin to develop these open spaces inside of the inside of the uh, secondary follicle. So from an anatomical perspective, we begin to have this fluid. that begins to envelop or surround the oocyte. And this pushes away, this pushes away the granulosa cells. And so I, I don't know if you can see this too well. Uh, you can see some of it over here. You have this layer of cells around uh, around, uh, around the follicle. I'm sorry, not the follicle, around the oocyte. And then you have these other layers of cells and you're beginning to develop these open spaces. So that layer of, of fluid and cells that are immediately around the oocyte is called the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida. Outside of the zona of pellucida, immediately around the oocyte, you have the granulosa cells. And those granulosa cells, they continue to develop further. So they've already transitioned from squamous shape to cuboidal shape. So they continue that developmental progression. And as they develop further, have this development of what's known as the protoplasmic contacts that are made to the oocyte, which are basically, you can't really see them, but you have these um, contacts through the zona pellucida, that kind of inner, inner clear zone to the oocyte. And then what surrounds the rest of the follicle here. So the zona pellucida on the inside, protoplasmic contact with the zona pellucida and with the oocyte, and then the surrounding creates the zona granulosa. So we can kind of think about this as you have the oocyte in the middle, you have this layer on the very outside called the zona pellucida, and then you have this layer here on the outside called the zona granulosa. Now, the other thing that begins to develop here anatomically in the secondary follicle is we begin to develop 
develop receptors that are specific for the sperm receptor. Species-specific sperm receptors. I have no clue why these sperm receptors exist. And if you think about it, why would they exist? What's the implication here for species-specific sperm receptors? The implication is that this prevents cross species fertilization. How could you possibly have cross-species fertilization? Uh, yeah, let's talk about within humans. I think that's probably the, the most profound place. And the question becomes, like, is that really a common thing? Like, does that happen a lot? And the answer is, wow. But there's actually, and so I've thought a lot about this, and I, I don't know why I thought a lot about this, but this is just bizarre. Because bestiality or sex with other organisms outside of your species is really rare. And so the question becomes, why, why is this a thing? And one of the things that I have thought of, that this is potentially a thing, is because God knew that humans were inherently evil. And there was a project in the early 1900s in the Soviet Union where uh, Stalin initiated a program where he was trying to crossbreed female uh, humans to male chimpanzees. And it never worked. And the reason it never worked is probably because, some of, because of some of this. But had it worked, you would not, or had fertilization been possible, you would have never produced humans. You would have produced some sort of life form that probably would not have been sustainable because chimpanzees and humans are very genetically different, a different number of chromosomes. And so that's the only thing that I can think of is it was to prevent the evil of, uh, the evil of our nation from going further than it already has. That's the only thing I can really come up with. So it is very difficult, probably not possible at all, for cross-species fertilization to occur. In fact, this is part of our definition of what a species is. A species is defined as the inability to, or, or is defined as the ability to, um, to fertilize and produce viable offspring, right? So. Lions and tigers, you can produce, yeah, lions and tigers are there. So lions and tigers, you can produce ligers or tigons, right? They're probably not really the same species because they're, those hybrids are all infertile. They, they don't really have any, any, any ability to, to uh, propagate. But they're close enough together as fat species or a sea lion that you still can have fertilization that occurs even though it's not really a viable offspring. Yes. I don't know if you can this or not, but how is, in light of this, how is the group of not going to stand or not? I mean, it's debated whether they were a different species or not, and it's somewhat different from the Okay, so I'm going to expand your question a little bit. Um, first of all, the science behind genetics indicates that they pretty 
strongly that we all have a mixture of genes that are classically defined as Neanderthal genes and genes that are classically defined as Homo sapiens. Okay? Now, the reason I'm going to expand this is because it's not just Homo Neanderthal Kansas, you have Homo Heidelbergensis, you have Homo Florsiensis. I actually think that all of those things that you've broken up and divided out are all probably realistically Homo sapien, Neanderthal Kansas, Homo sapien. Sapien, Homo sapien, Forciensis, all created in the image of God, all really are covered by the creation story and are all ancestral to Adam. So I would not, I don't think, and in, in, in one of the people who, Todd Wood, is, is one of the guys who's kind of had the edge of thought on, on uh, um, the connection of all the different hominoids and species together. Uh, I don't think that they're probably, I think they fall into a ability to fertilize and produce viable offspring. And so I think that's why we have relics of what are classically referred to as Neanderthal genes. Uh, when you look at human genetics in, uh, through, through time, like how crazy is it that it points back to one ancestor, right? That paper came out, that, that article came out in 2015 and talked about how all humans on the planet now came from a single ancestor. I mean, we just didn't name it in the scientific article, but I think you can here. It's Adam and it's Eve. Right? So that was our single commonality. <laughs> when you look at all of these other people groups, Neanderthals, uh, the, the uh, hobbits that come from the island, of course, all of those individuals. They're probably not very distinct if you want to keep up. Um, and so even morphologically, if you put, you know, there's the, I think, Zyko, is, is that the camera the, they have the caveman? If so, each caveman can do it. The problem I have with, with kind of that joke is I think if you would take a Neanderthal and put him in a suit and give him a razor, you're probably not really going to be able to sell that much morphological and anatomical differences to a modern homo sapiens. It's not like we're looking at Neanderthal was a much more ape-like individual than Homo sapiens. They are much more Homo sapiens than they were probably. Yeah, there's, is there no is there no cranial diversity on the planet today? And there's just, sure, it is, and there's a lot of really distinct characteristics. If you look at the Maasai people in Africa, they are very tall, much taller on average than Chinese. Does that mean that the Chinese and the Maasai people in Africa are distinct people groups because of their morphological differences? Most likely not. Okay. Would you agree with that? So that's what I'm saying is that there's a, there's a lot of diversity even today, morphologically and even physiologically, in the human species that is probably a lot closer to the variation that we see in time than we really want to kind of believe in science. Don't take, don't take that for granted, but that's my initial thought on um, I, I think that we could, I think that we could probably define a lot of those in the individual organisms, so to speak. As very common in their genetics and anatomy, enough that they can be defined as the same species as other individuals. Okay. I really don't like to So it's really interesting that you bring that up. There was a study, and it was a case study that was done by an anthropologist in the state of Washington. This guy was weird. So he wanted to know why did they have the brow breast? Why did they have such a prominent brow breast? So out of modeling clay, they made a brow breast. 
and he affixed it to his forehead, and he went out into the woods, the temperate rainforest in the, Olymp in the Olympic Peninsula out in, in Oregon, and did just normal tasks. He had a dog with him, he was out there, and he concluded that most likely it was their hair out of their face. And so that kind of goes towards your idea that we do have an ability. I don't like to use the word we, we've evolved. I like to use the term we've adapted to our environments. And when you look at places where individuals are continuously exposed to the sun and there's low rainfall, their skin color is much darker than our skin color. Comes down to a physiological question. And that physiological question is answered by the production and distribution of pigmentation in the skin. It has no other effects other than it protects the nucleus of the cell with genetic information. That seems like a really reasonable adaptation to that environment. So does that mean that we adapt to the environment? That's what, yeah, that's what I'm saying, is that, 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 that the exposure to unique conditions within the environment drives the anatomy and the physiology. But they're not massive changes in anatomy and physiology. If I go and spend the summer in the sun, what happens to my skin? It gets darker. I may not have the same genetic capacity to... I mean, I don't have the same genetic capacity to become a black person. But I definitely become much darker in my complexion. I'm saying that through generation after generation, or maybe it was even God said, this is where you're going to live. These are the unique set of human characteristics that you need to survive in this environment. And so he gave the genetic, the genetic, uh, information to allow development of heavy pigmentation to protect the nucleus of the individuals from the sun they're constantly going to be exposed to. Yeah. I don't know entirely how to answer all of these questions. But I think that there's reasonable explanations outside of, oh, clearly there's just a huge amount of evolutionary adaptation. And yeah, I, I I was the first time I heard about this idea of looking at the, the different skulls from Neanderthal, Hypoorganthus, all of these different hominoid species. The idea that they are all traded in God's image was pretty profound. Because I think when we read scripture, we think that Jesus is somebody that looks just like like us. We think Moses is someone who looks just like us. We think Adam and Eve looks just like us. And that probably isn't true. Scripture doesn't seem to indicate that either way, but I think science would indicate that throughout time, throughout history, there have been there have been changes that have occurred. I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. Because this is probably not gonna work. <laughs> Like, is someone said that 